Christmas is a time of surprises. Had a number of Christmas surprises this year. Um, it's about a week and a half ago. My day was fully planned. You know, wait for Sunday to show up was on every hour of my calendar. And um, had a number of things just had to get done. And in the middle of that, someone walked in that needed a little help. They needed uh, a ride to a hospital in downtown Cleveland. And for some reason, I knew that I had to provide that ride. Now, trust me, I had things to do. Melinda had laid out her laundry list of things that needed done. And um, I just knew. And I said, hold those appointments or cancel them, postpone them, what have you. I'm going to take him to Cleveland. And I couldn't understand at that moment why. Ben went out and got the car ready to go. And uh, he hopped in and away we went. Well, we just no sooner got onto I-90 than it suddenly struck me that we were hurtling down the road in about 2,000 pounds of steel, rubber, and plastic at about 70 miles per hour for about an hour. He couldn't get out. And I just turned to him and I said, you know, you're in a car for about an hour with a pastor, right? And he got this look in his eyes. <laughs> and I just asked him, do you understand the gospel? Do you, do you know what the gospel is? Do you understand all that? And there was a moment and then he said something that I hope I never forget. He said, no one ever cared enough about me to ask if I understood the gospel. He'd been in and out a number of churches over his life, never been like a regular attender, but said he'd, you know, since he was a kid anyhow. But then no one had ever cared enough. And you know the reason that that hit me so hard? It's because I've known this guy for a while. And I care about him. And I'd never asked. You want to know what my Christmas surprise was that morning? When I got down to the part where I said, well, you know, there it is. What do you think? He said, I want it. I want to know Jesus. And I had the opportunity to pray with him, so I just kind of glanced over him, and I assured him I would keep my eyes open, but that we were going to pray. And about three minutes later, he was my brother in Christ. And it was a beautiful Christmas present. It was awesome. It, it fueled my fire, if you will. Reignited the passion that I have for what, for what we do, because that is who we are. We love the Lord, we love one another, but what do we do? We make disciples of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that was a beautiful Christmas surprise. We had another one in our family too. I hope you don't mind, darling. I don't want to steal your glory, but um, Jan's mom was recently diagnosed with breast cancer, and um, she had to go in for the big surgery, and. Went in that day and all the tests had said, you know, these things are what they are. And so we're just starting down this road. And um, when she went in that morning, they did some more testing and said, well, it looks like this thing has grown. And that means we're probably going to have to do radiation and all that other stuff. And then they took a biopsy and they waited for noon to begin the surgery. And when they went in to do the surgery, it was supposed to be a three hour deal. And about an hour in, the family was called back. Can you imagine the thoughts that were running through our family's mind as they went back an hour in? And um, the doctor, the surgeon, had actually grown up with Jan. Um, they'd hung out when they were kids. Their parents were friends, you know, with the, with the doctor and his family. So this was the kid who had now grown up to become a doctor. And he came in, and I guess there was no mistaking it. I wasn't there, but Jan said the smile went somewhere from one ear to the next. And they're like, what's going on? He said, there's no cancer there. Christmas miracle. Christmas surprise. 
Christmas has been full of surprises for our, for our family this year. I don't, I don't know if you've been looking for, uh, you know, what God was going to do to reveal himself to you. Um, I had a little surprise this morning at uh, about 4.25 or so. I came down the steps and there's my son saying, you've got to see this. You've got to see this thing. And it's awesome. There's this video um, with this guy who's got a new style of preaching and everything. He's making a, an impact for the kingdom of God. I can tell you he's even made some of the news, the national news, um, because of his different style. But he showed me this video, and I was like, my kid's been hanging out with the Lord throughout the night. You know, that's a pretty cool Christmas surprise for me. My kid hanging out with the Lord and, and with the other guys and gals. It's on the Internet. It's different than it was when we were kids, but it's still awesome. Christmas surprises. Now, when we read the old story, the old Christmas story, there are many things that take our breath away. But if you look carefully, you'll see that there was a ton of surprises. The first one is that God would show up on the planet in the form of a baby. And it wasn't in a king's court, but rather in a manger, a place for animals. Surprise, I think so. That he'd uh, choose to proclaim the news through angels not to the newspapers of the day, not to the bigwigs of the day, but to those who were herding sheep out during the time of year when lambs were going to begin to come. So that's when the shepherds would actually sleep with their sheep and be out there. And that's how God chose to announce the birth. I mean, surprise after surprise after surprise as we read this old story. You know... It's times like Christmas when there's a song in the air and there's all the excitement that comes as you look at the faces of the kids. Wasn't that beautiful this morning? With, um, it's just gorgeous the way Santa was greeted by the kids. Some of them were like this and others were like this. It, wasn't it cool? It's just awesome. I don't think anyone had more surprise than Mary. I wonder if we could think that through this morning. I've got a short video I've asked the gentleman to play back there. And as we look at the surprises that Mary encountered, let's start um, maybe preparing our eyes to catch the surprise that Christ has. Moments Christ. of realization that take our breath away. Surprises that come and we're not ready for them just makes everything kind of stop for a minute. And when you read through this Christmas story, there's all kinds of new surprises. Like, how about this one? When you, when you read through and you realize that Mary couldn't speak. She talked with an angel in Nazareth. If you read further in the story, she actually went to visit Elizabeth uh, pretty far away, but she, it says that she not only talked there, but she sang with Elizabeth, right? But in the whole narrative of the Christmas story, not a single word is recorded of what Mary spoke. It's kind of as if what happened to her was too deep to be described in words. The last thing it says is that she just kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She's caught up in some form of joy where all she could do was ponder. She spoke no more. Read the story again. I checked it out. I kept going. I thought, really? Mary doesn't say a thing once the baby's born? Couldn't find it. I was surprised by that. And you know, that kind of experience is, is uncommon today. We spend so much more time doing than being, if you think about it. You know, our faith has become a, kind of like a, an exterior thing. Much more commotion, Scott, than devotion. Devotion. 
That's what I was thinking this morning when I came downstairs. My son had been in devotion throughout the night because he's a night owl like his mom. And I thought I'd come down here to make sure I can put together the right words to, and you know what? I told Jan when she got up, instead of trying to crank out the right words, I went over to my chair and sat down and tried to follow my son's example, just kind of hang out with God for a little bit. It was transformative. Surprise. <laughs> Seems that sometimes our expression of love for God, it just becomes very much an extroverted, um, external, almost a showy thing at times. You know, we sometimes chide adolescents because they are in love with, you know, loud horns and loud stereos and loud exhaust pipes. And yet it seems to me that in some ways, those things have become kind of like the symbol of the church, you know, with all our loud noises, maybe even the foolish long-winded drone of a pastor in the pulpit. Because Mary's example here upon her surprise is silence. <laughs> Perhaps Christmas is the kind of time when the best that we can do is just sit back and contemplate what God has done, what he's doing, where he's going. It says that this same silent Mary who held not only her baby but her Savior just kind of leaned back on the warm damp earth and it says she pondered all these things in her heart. <laughs> I am surprised. Every time I actually get quiet enough to be silent, how God shows up. I don't know why it's a surprise every time. It's not like I don't know it, but I'm so busy doing and being the commotion that when I take time to just bask in his presence and express my devotion to God, that he shows up. Thanks, buddy. I wonder what she pondered. And I, I just kind of have a couple of things that come to mind. I wonder what she thought of when she thought about Christ's approach to entrance into the world. Because, I mean... There she was in a quiet little place for animals. It, it was not what we'd call a Bethlehem spectacular, you know? It, it's interesting that we read nowhere in Scripture that God knocks anybody's door down to announce the coming. There's no horns. The angels, it said, just appeared, an entire host of them, but they're out in the countryside with a whole bunch of woolies and just a few sheepers. He doesn't knock anybody's door down. Instead, Jesus just quietly says, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart, and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens to me, I'll come in. You ever thought that verse through? That's a pretty quiet approach. The painting by Holman Hunt that hangs in the British National Gallery in London. Um, Jesus is standing there gently rapping at the door, but the door's unopened. There's a little boy that was standing in front of the painting with his dad, and he said, Pops, why don't they answer the door? Hmm. And the father said, I don't know why. And just that for a moment, and then the young, youngster said, Well, maybe... They're making too much noise to hear him knocking. There might be some truth there. You see, the infinite power of God always seems to move in silence, in quiet. That's why we call it, um, have you heard God speak? Because he speaks in a still, small voice. You've heard those words before, right? It's like we kind of know it, but we don't get it. 
those tides that cleanse our shores and launch our ships are pooled by something called our moon. It's done in silence, that whole thing um, with the tides. The moon does nothing but shine as far as I know, and yet it moves all the laboring surges of this planet, all the tides going in and out. When springtime comes, it doesn't, it, it doesn't come with a whole bunch of banners and, and parades, rolling drums or sounding trumpet. God just kind of moves in quietness. That's perhaps the reason why the number one way that people say that they commune with God is through nature. That's, it's been since I was a kid I've heard preachers saying that, and I've checked it out. And you know what? Every poll they do, the majority of people who say that they, when are they closest to God, they almost always go to a scene in nature. Just something quiet. Where the least noise is. And you know what? It is when I shut up that I've heard God speak. And no, I'm not hearing voices, although I'd love that sometime. But many times I hear him speak through my wife's voice, perhaps even my son or my daughter's. I think I saw a little, little uh, window into God's world through your little one this morning. Looked up at Santa and just right like that, you know? Awesome. Sometimes I think God whispers to us in the simpleness of common sense, which is sadly lacking. And I'm going to give you my answer as to why, because we're all too noisy. I have a feeling this sermon is going to come back to bite me really hard. Have you ever heard God speak through the gentleness of just like a new idea? <laughs> and just as he is with us, so he was with his only son, Jesus. He spoke to Jesus through the gentle words of his mom, Mary, and her silence. Don't miss it. Yeah, I mean, look, look through the scripture this week. See if you can find it. I can't find a word. He speaks to her. He speaks to us. He spoke to his son in the silence. Through the lilies of the field. An inner voice that was the commanding guide for all of Jesus' days. Our guide through all of our days. Because we who have accepted Christ have received his Holy Spirit. Amen? But you know what? Sometimes I can get pretty noisy and I miss it. Too busy doing instead of being. But in that kind of quietness, the time when the Spirit is not just within you but seems to be all about you, all around you, I think that... Uh, that's why Christmas silence is the best. Christmas is still the time when the whole world just kind of holds its breath, tries to hear once again the, the soft cry of a baby, a still small voice. So hallowed, so gracious is this time, it says that Mary would not say a word, she just pondered it all in her heart. She pondered the silence of God's approach. And, and Christ came not, not just to someone like Mary, but he also came to, for someone like me, those who are unworthy. I, I, I think that Mary pondered the, the lowliness of her son's audience because shepherds were at the bottom of the status pole in those days, all right? Somewhere up here is all the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the people with money and all the other folks that are just trying to make a living as innkeepers and what have you. But at the very bottom rung, you've got yourself the shepherds, right? And I think God's coming to shepherds silently speaks volumes. And the shepherds, of course, didn't grasp what had happened. You can't capture the ocean in a single straw. 
but they were the first to know it. And they were the ones charged to go and spread the news, and they did. We know the story 2,000 years later because of some shepherds. Hmm. At the center of the gospel is the truth that the knowledge of God is not reserved for the wealthy or for the worthy, but rather for all, every single one of us. Came across a collection of letters that children wrote to Santa Claus, not the one that was in the paper. Some of them were pretty good, but one said, Dear Santa, you didn't bring me anything good last year. You didn't bring me anything good the year before. This is your last chance. And then it was signed, Alfred. <laughs> Here's another one. Dear Santa, there's three little boys who live at our house. There's Jeffrey, he is two. There is David, he is four. There is Norman, he is seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time. David's good some of the time. But Norman is good all of the time. I am Norman. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you want to know what I've come to realize? I'm not Norman. I'm more like the shepherds. I'm more like uh, the unworthy. Hmm. There's a guy who, some Christmas, a, year, a Christmas some years back, his uh, little boy was uh, killed by a 15-year-old that was driving a car without a license. And... Um, the father was filled with the desire for revenge. And even though this 15-year-old was not to be brought before the full power of the court because he was a juvenile, the father wanted the whole book thrown at him. He wanted revenge. And then it was Christmas Eve. And he writes in his memoirs that on Christmas Eve, his wife had to convince him, but he finally agreed to go to church. He was still at the point where he was angry at God angry at everyone because there would be no justice for his son. And it said while he was there, the story about the shepherds came up and the pastor mentioned something about the shepherds and where they were in the status of life. And he says, I began to weep when he realized that he was one of the world's unworthy, one of the world's ungood, he began to weep. And when he went out of the church the next day on Christmas, he set out to find found out more about this 15-year-old boy who had killed his son. He found that he came from a broken home. He found that he was living with his mother. And he found out that mom was an alcoholic and spent very little time at the home where the boy was consigned to spend most of his time. So he went and he met the boy and he gave him a job in his shop. Later, took him into his home. Kind of like a, having like a second mom or a second dad, have some of us have. That boy, now a young man, you know what he calls the father? A blessing. He's come to know Christ because of this dad. I mean, he killed this man's son with his car but forgiveness, which is divine, which is supernatural, which is hard to do, changed everything. Instead of revenge, he pursued Christ with his own life, and then he pursued Christ for that young boy. And you know, that's what a saint is. And I call you guys saints all the time. I say, good morning, saints and stuff. And this because that's what scripture calls us. It doesn't mean that we're the ones that get painted on the um, painted glass. A saint is someone who's ungood or unworthy, made worthy, made good by Christ. Each one of us who have had Christ born in our heart, in a silent moment somewhere, are now saints. And I'm surprised by that. Because I'll tell you what, I don't feel like any saint. And if you can say amen to that with me, then misery loves company and we're all together. But I'm still surprised by it. And so I guess I want to, you know how we, we hear people um, 
say, boy, I want to see Christmas through the eyes of a kid again. Well, think that through. I want to see Christ through fresh eyes. I want to relive the surprise, if you will. Just begin to ponder things like Mary did. Ready for anything because she put her trust in God. <laughs> Didn't hesitate to say that she needed help, the help of others, because she knew the greatest waste of life is to try to go through it all alone. <laughs> she sang the victory song of the human spirit in that what we call Mary's Magnificat. It begins, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Hmm. And so if I could give you this morning a, a gift, if I could give each one of you a gift, it would be a surprise, a Christmas surprise. It would be the, the pondering heart of Mary who lay there silent on the straw and just pondered her babe her savior, who she was cradling in her arms, the silence of his arrival, the lowliness of his approach. Surprise, even to this day, with all the surprises that, that Christmas reveals in a story that is shrouded in silence, proclaimed in loneliness, we still sing glory to God in the highest. Amen? From my heart, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. And I'm making a play on words there. But I hope that you won't just, you know, let this thing go, oh, yeah, Pastor O'Pine for about 20 minutes on Merry Christmas. I hope you'll think it through. Because I think you'll find surprises are waiting for you right around the corner. Experiencing Christ in a fresh new way as you have a Merry Christmas. Okay, praise team, come on up. I'm going to pray. Father God, I just thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to share the wonder of your birth once again. Lord, as we sing, help that joy that we feel in our heart to be expressed through our voices. Help us to rediscover you in a fresh new way. Help us even to embrace, even for a few moments, the blessing of silence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.